Ezra. And Ezra is easy enough found if you go to the book of Psalms and work your way back, you come to Job, then we come to Esther, and then we come to Nehemiah, and then we come to Ezra. And we're turning this morning to <clears throat> the book of Ezra and chapter number 8, please. The book of Ezra, and we're in chapter number 8. Recorded for us this morning in the book of Ezra is the story of release, the story of the ending of the 70-year captivity for the Jews in the land of Babylon. You know, it was time to go home for the Jews. And you know the story well, I'm sure, of how the Jews were brought to Babylon through Nebuchadnezzar the king. And it was time now, time for the Jews to go home, time for the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And it was their heart's desire to rebuild the temple. Long before they went to captivity, God prophesied all of this through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, verse 10, we read, For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good toward you in causing you to return to this place. And you know, friend, right, and God fulfilled that. That proves to us this morning that God performs His Word. God fulfills His Word. And listen, child of God, there's a lot of words in this book God has yet to perform. And God will perform. And then... But the sad side of the story of Ezra is this. Even though the door swung open in Babylon to allow the Jews to return in their land, the sad side of the story was that the majority of the Jews didn't want to return home. The reason why they didn't want to return home was because they settled down in Babylon. They got comfortable in Babylon. They were happy in Babylon. And they didn't want to go home. They were comfortable. The majority were content to remain. Do you know why they were comfortable in Babylon? Do you know why they had no heart for Jerusalem? Because they had no desire for God. They had no heart for true worship. They had no heart for truth because when the door opened under Cyrus, the king of Persia, even though the Lord was fulfilling his, fulfilling his promise, even though it was time to go home, the majority wanted to stay. That's sad, you know, because the majority of the Jews were happy. The majority of the Jews were content not only to settle there, not only to stay there, but to bring their children up under the doctrine of paganism and idolatry. The true story is Babylon wasn't the real home, but they were content there. They were comfortable there. They were settled there. And Babylon, had, or sorry, the Jews, had no heart for home. They had no heart for God. That's why, child of God, the apostle Paul wrote to the Romans. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, be not conformed to this world. Child of God, listen, this world is not our real home this morning. Glory to God, it's not. Heaven is our home. Heaven's our home. 
And thank God this morning we're heading home this morning. Listen, don't get settled down in the world. Don't get comfortable in the world. Too many of God's people today, and they've got settled in the world, and they've got conformed to the world, and they've got comfortable in the world, and there's no heart for God. No heart for God. No heart for the truth. No heart for true worship. No heart for home. And that's the sad story of Ezra this morning. Even though the doors opened, they were free to go home, but the majority of the Jews wanted to stay. But there was the remnant who had a heart for God, who had a heart for home, made for home, headed for home. And this morning in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 we see Ezra here, and in verse 21, we read, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahav, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. And we know that the Lord will bless that reading to our hearts this morning. The title of God's message is Prioritized Praying for Heading Home. Ezra and the remnant of the Jews, listen, they just didn't start heading for home. Ezra and the remnant got their priorities right this morning because they sought God for that journey. Prioritized praying for heading home. Child of God this morning, we're heading home. 2016 could be the year that could see us home. The Lord could come. I'll tell you, this day could be the very day that could see us home. Or maybe the Lord could call us home. But you know, as we make our way homeward this morning, we need to make and take this ministry of prayer seriously. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse 21, there's the proclamation for prayer. Look what he says in verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahav. Do you know this morning, child of God, the one who proclaims and makes a proclamation for prayer he does it for two reasons. The first reason is that they confess, first of all, their need of God. Their need of God. Listen, child of God, that's one thing I think we've all lost this morning. That sense of our need of God. But the second reason as to why Ezra proclaimed and made a proclamation for prayer was because they not only believed in their need of God, but they believed that God could meet their need. Tell me this, child of God, have you that sense in your heart? Have you that sense in your soul? This need of God? I believe that's why the church and the church as a whole is saying nothing. To, we've lost our sense of our need of God. 
I'll tell you, friend, Esther saw her need of God. She proclaimed a fast. Do you remember in Ezra chapter 4 and verse 6 when Haman and the king had signed the degree that the Jews were to be wiped out in one day? Esther called a fast and said, Proclaim a fast for me. Friend, if there ever was a day we need to get down to the matter of prayer, it's this day. You remember Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, when the Moabites and the Ammonites were against them, they were outnumbered. We read that Jehoshaphat sought the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. Do you know, prioritized praying is not just praying. It's setting out the pattern of prayer in a prioritized way. First of all, there was the proclamation for prayer, and the first sense that brings that to the fore is our sense of our need of God. Tomorrow night begins our week of prayer. Have you that sense of need of God that's going to bring you to the prayer meeting each night? Our need of God. Do you know what's wrong? And I'm, I'm, I'm including myself in this. I'm including myself. Do you know what's wrong? We're not desperate enough for God. Do you remember Mary? In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, do you remember Mary there when Peter was put in prison? Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. You remember there was a mighty, mighty need, an impossible situation for Peter. He was to be beheaded the next morning to be executed because it pleased the Jews, and Herod had taken him. What did Mary do? Mary called a prayer meeting. And they all gathered in the house of prayer to seek God because she was desperate. That's why she had it in her home. She was desperate for God to move. And I'll tell you, them who were gathered with her were desperate. The sad thing today is this. Too many of God's people run to gospel concerts, but they don't run to prayer meetings. I got a notice through my door the other day. There's a gospel concert in the Armagh City Hotel. You'll go there that night. There'll be hundreds at it. Hundreds! And you have to pay to get into it. Place will be packed. And men, you yeah, like gospel concert. There's nothing like good gospel singing. Ah, but you know, if they were to advertise this morning a prayer meeting for God to move and for God to come down in Ulster and for God to turn the country back to God, you wouldn't get perhaps six rows filled. And you don't have to pray and to pay to get into it. The problem with the Christian heart today is this. We long to be entertained. But there's no burden. That's the problem. That's the problem. Revival will not come through concerts. It'll come when God's people are desperate for God to move. Ezra, what did you do? What did you do? I proclaimed a fast. You know, we have a United Church's prayer meeting every month. And it's so downhearted and so discouraging to see how many goes to it, how few goes to it. And what saddens me still, some men only go to it when it's in their own church. Man who does that isn't desperate for God to move.
John Wesley used to rise at 4 a.m. in the morning and pray at 9 o'clock in, in the morning. Five hours he spent in prayer before he opened his Bible. The proclamation for prayer. I want you to notice, secondly, in that very same verse, the preparation for prayer. You look at that verse again. Now, look at it for yourself. He says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God. It wasn't just about getting boys together and dropping on your knees and starting to pray. No. Oh, no. No. It wasn't about that at all, you know. It's not just this morning about calling a prayer meeting, and it's not just attending a prayer meeting. There has to be preparation of heart this morning. That we, Ezra said, might afflict ourselves before our God. There had to be preparation for prayer. There had to be preparation for to receive the blessing and for to receive the help of God that was needed. And the blessing and the help of God that is required. Afflicting ourselves means humbling ourselves. Humbling ourselves before God says to God before we even start praying, Lord, Lord, we're worthless, we're useless without Thee. That's what afflicting yourselves means. Lord, we're powerless, we're helpless, we're helpless, we're useless without you, Lord. We need you. That's what humbling yourselves is. It's not rattling out a few hymns before you pray, you know. Humility of heart, Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, because pride doesn't seek God. Pride doesn't need God. But humility hungers for God. A proud person in the service for God often falls because a proud person often has no dependency upon God. Humility of heart that's how you afflict yourselves before God. Ah, but then there's the sincerity of spirit. Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It's, prepare, it's preparation before you pray. What does Psalm 24, verse 4 and 5 says? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up a soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. I quote John Wesley again. John Wesley used to say, It haunts me to think that I could approach God with the stain of sin in my heart. Prioritized praying means preparation before we pray. Thirdly, in the very same verse, you've got the proclamation for prayer. You've got the preparation for prayer. Look at, you've got the direction for prayer. To seek of Him, what? A right way for us. You know, these Jews this morning, they were making a 900-mile journey back home. And their priority was, Lord, it's not my way. It's not in this direction that I think. Lord, you lead us home. You direct us home. You see, child of God this morning, listen, you young people, if God wills, you have a lot of life ahead of you. Listen, get down on your knees and say, Lord, I seek of you a right way for my life. As for God, His way is perfect. 
His way may be difficult. His way may be dark. His way may be demanding. Ah, oh, but young people, everybody, older people, His ways are perfect. We're heading home, child of God. Ah, oh, but let's seek of God a right way for us. We don't want to go home our own way. We want to go home the way the Lord wants us to go home. And here's the lesson. God's leading for your life. God's leading will provide grace for every step. Listen. Put your future plans into God's hands. Put, put your hopes into God's hands. Put your dreams into God's hand. Where are I do, whatever I do, where I may go, where I may be, it's still God's hand that leadeth me. Oh, you know, child of God, as we make this pilgrim journey this morning, are we listening? Let us seek God a right way for us. In Isaiah 30, verse 21, he says, Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Did you notice the direction for prayer, the proclamation for prayer, the preparation for prayer? Ah, but very importantly now, will you look at the generation for prayer? It's in verse 21. Take a good look at verse 21 again. It says there, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of Him a right way for us and for our little ones. Oh, there's a generation for prayer in that verse. Aye, there's preparation and there's proclamation. Ah, but you know, and there's direction. Ah, but there's a generation for prayer. Our little ones this morning. If there's a generation, child of God, if there's a generation that needs our prayers, it's our little ones. Ah, the little ones that come up to the front every day. Let me tell you, are you praying for them? Those little ones that come out at the front every Lord's Day and away up them stairs to the crest helmet, are we praying for them? If there's a generation that needs prayer, it's our little ones. Because sitting at the front of this tabernacle there is your future oversight. Your future leadership. People tell me children are the church of tomorrow. Rubbish! They're the church of the day as much as they are the morrow. Because if they're not the church of today, how can they be the church of tomorrow? Yes, and they're as much as important, and we need to be praying for our little ones. Mothers, are you praying for your little one this morning? Fathers, listen to me. Are you praying for your little ones? Why are you not at the prayer meeting? Now, mothers, you listen to me for a wee moment. This is the Lord. This is nothing to do with me. This is the Lord. The mother's place on a Thursday night, I believe, is a home. If you can come to the prayer meeting, God bless you for it. You have a wee one at home and maybe three or four wee ones at home. He should be at the prayer meeting praying for them. There's no use you running to the prayer meeting when they're teenagers and they're off the rails. Now's the time when they're little. You should be at the prayer meeting praying for them. And you mothers, you get to take this from me now. If he's thinking at laying at home on a Thursday night, will you shove him out to the prayer meeting and get him to pray for your wee ones, your little one? For that's where every prayer father should be at the prayer meeting. You have a way in growing up in a dark and a difficult and a wicked world, and you need to be praying for them, brother. Not laying at home watching the football.
children are a heritage of the Lord. Psalm 127, verse 3, and you should be praying for them. People say to me, ah, but I pray at home. I'll tell you about home praying. There's too much distractions. And is there really praying? Sincere praying at home. You'll not get too much distractions in the prayer meeting here on a Thursday night. And you should be here praying for your Sunday school teachers that's teaching your little ones. And you should be at the prayer meeting praying for the leaders of the adventures that's praying for your little ones. And you should be at the prayer meeting in there on a Thursday praying for the ones who speak to them on the Lord's Day morning. And fathers, this is between you and God. It's not between you and me. I remember Pastor Willie Mullen telling the story of a father who landed at his door in Windsor Avenue in an awful way. Oh, Mr. Mullen, Mr. Mullen, will you come and talk to my son? He's in hospital and he's, he's at death's door. Mr. Mullen, Mr. Mullen, will you come and talk to him? And Mr. Mullen, I never knew the man, but he turns to the man and says, what are you coming run looking me for? That's what he said to him. What are you coming run looking me for? He says, I've been in Lurgan for over 23 years and I've never saw you at a prayer meeting yet and you come and run to me. I'll tell you this. You see, your little ones, you need to be praying for their wives if he's a wee fella. It's not too, not too soon to start praying for his wife. You know, that wee lad that's sitting cuddling on your knee. You need to be praying for his wife. And I'll tell you that wee lassie, you need to be praying for their, for, for, for their husband. Don't be praying for, don't start praying for their wife and praying for their husband when they start dating each other. Get that to pray now, child of God. It's too serious not to pray for our little ones. There's a generation for prayer. And there's a possession for prayer and all our substance. Of course, as I was speaking about all the precious, all the precious vessels that were used for worship in the old, uh, in the old temple, they were bringing that home. You know, child of God, we have treasures and earthen vessels that needs to be prayed for. Paul writing to the Corinthians church and said in Corinthians 4 verse 7, concerning the gospel message, he says, we have this treasure in earth and vessels, and we need to be praying for the gospel and for the good news that we have that it doesn't become flawed. Because do you see, if there's one message that's being flawed in pulpits today, it's the old-fashioned gospel message. And that's the treasure, child of God, that you and I have in these earthen vessels. The message of the gospel. Sure, they're watering it down now. You don't mention hell. You don't mention the blood. You don't preach the cross. They want a comfortable Christianity that sends people to hell. But look at the protection for prayer. We'll go into verse 22 and I'm finished. For I was ashamed to require of the king of band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way. Why? Why were you ashamed, Ezra? Because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek of him. But his power and his wrath is against all that forsake him. I'm telling you now, Ezra, Boys, he knew how to set out the pattern for prayer, never mind of prayer. For prayer. And there's not a day in your Christian life, brother, and there's not a day in your Christian life, sister, and in mine, we need to pray for protection because the enemy is out to get us. We're heading home. Aye, we're heading home, are we? But we need to get serious about prayer. We need to get serious about prayer. You'll get boys tripping over others to get into pulpits. You don't get too many boys tripping over to get into the prayer meeting. 
or into the closet. If you want to see blessing for your life, sister, if you want to see blessing for your home, brother, and you want to see blessing for this fellowship, we need to get serious about prayer. Mark those down in your Bible. There's the proclamation for prayer. There's the preparation for prayer. There's the direction for prayer. There's a generation for prayer. There's a possession that we have for prayer, needs prayer. And there's a protection for prayer. And on this first Lord's Day morning, may God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, burn upon my heart, I, my heart, as well as your heart, the need for proper praying. May God bless it. And may God do it for His name's sake. Amen. 560 is our closing hymn in the Red Hymn Book. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons